We talked at length on the podcast about injuries, supporting teammates after Viv Miedema, Beth Mead as well. But it feels like some real change in the conversation since Leah Williamson's injury. Kelly, do you feel like now it's going to be addressed? Do you feel like there's been a change? Now's the time to do it, isn't it? I mean, Arsenal having three ACLs in one season, it's absolutely gobsmacking. And I hate... I hate the three letters ACL because I did my ACL in 2001. It was the hardest injury that I've ever come back from, Um, not just physically, but emotionally. Being away from the team for so long, um, losing your identity, losing your love for the game. Um, It's a hard road, hard path to go down. And so many young female players are doing it in our game now, not just at the elite level, um, but leagues, leagues below. So I think now the time is to... I know there's been quite a bit of research done already um, about menstrual cycles and um, how that could possibly possibly impact it. I know we need to keep investing in the the uh, building of the medical staff at clubs, um, having that access to top level physios and doctors. Um, I think the strength and conditioning programs need to be looked at. The, the loads. It's, there's so many topics um, and avenues that you can go down. Um, we talk about, you know, strength training from a young age um, with the youth, the young girls. They're probably not getting it as much as an academy boy would. Would So when the girls come up to first team football at the age of 18, they're put on a strength and conditioning program when they're not really been built up to strengthen their muscles. They're asked to play, you know, twist, move, turn in a robust way at a very young age, but probably don't have that stability yet. So I don't know the answer. None of us do. But I think we need to start seriously looking into it because I don't feel like it's fair for the players. It's not It's not nice for them to experience. It's such a hard injury to come back from. And yeah, we need to address it as soon as possible. Something you said there, and, and Izzy, I don't know if you want to pick up on it, but Kelly saying that she feel like she lost her identity. It's, it's that side of it too as well, isn't it? It's the mental health side of looking after people in these injuries as as much as now things seem to be changing people seem to be talking about it and hopefully the wake up call yeah it's 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 really really sad to hear you know of any teammate or fellow professional you know firstly suffering that injury but also you know the repercussions that come with it and losing your identity as a footballer is probably it's probably one of the worst places you can be Um, And a massive credit to anyone or to everyone that's come back from that, having felt those emotions. Um, The the biggest thing for me that stands out with this kind of, you know, would you call it sort of an epidemic in women's football at the moment, um, is is the players that have, have suffered this injury within the last 12 to 18 months. They're all at the absolute top of their careers. Now, for me, that says something in because they're playing so well and they're so valuable to their respective teams, their loading must be really high. And I'm not for one moment, you know, criticizing the load management of the players because, you know, they're, I'm sure they're in very good hands on a daily basis. But I'm just looking at it and going, well, it's so unfair that a player who's worked so hard to get to this kind of pinnacle point in their career then suffers an injury like this and it set it sets them back. And there's absolutely no guarantee they're going to come back from these injuries in the same state that they were before. Um, I mean, I, I really hope that they do. And, you know, for players like Beth and, and Leah, Beth Mead, Leah Williamson, um, you know, so valuable for England as well as Arsenal. Um, I really hope they can reestablish, you know, once they're back, that, that form that they that left on. But, but Izzy, just coming, coming back to that, you do think that there is a thought in your mind thinking... Can I reach those levels again? There's doubt in your mind as you're going through that process because on a daily basis, your rehab is so difficult. Some days you might feel good and the next day you've got to take two steps back because your knee's swollen. It's such an emotional roller coaster that you go on. And that's why I think it's vitally important that they speak to a psychologist. I couldn't be around my team um, coming back from my injury. It was hurting me so bad. Um, And there was some anger issues towards me so, some I hate to say this but sometimes I wanted my team to lose because I wanted them to miss me and then when they were winning I was upset because they don't need me it's all these physical emotions that are coming around in your head and you just think I'm such a bad person for feeling that so I think that's why it was I didn't get access to a sports psychologist at the time and hence 
I didn't know who I was. I didn't, I was Kelly Smith, the footballer. And when that was taken away from me, I didn't, I, I, I hated myself. I didn't know how to be. Yeah. It's such a hard injury to come back from. And you never know if you're going to get to that level or whether you're going to surpass it. It's, I mean, Izzy, you've suffered an Achilles injury, right? It's a similar, yeah, Achilles not, and ankle, it's yeah. the emotional side of it that's hard. Yeah, I completely agree. And when and when you, you get around a major tournament, that's when the emotions become even higher. Mm. I, I missed I spoke about this on a previous part. I missed a World Cup with a broken leg. Um the rehab journey to get back for that was horrendous, um mm. so, psychologically. But I mean a positive example of a player who a teammate of mine, Nicoline Sorensen, who who scored the winner for us yesterday, you know, she's on her journey back from an ACL. And I'm a really really close close friends with her and, and seeing the the emotional, you know, the, the pressure that she put on herself to get back and get back well was unbelievable. I had to grab her sometimes and say, there is no pressure on you to come back and score or assist or be great in a game. You need to be, you need to work your way back. It's easy saying that, but the support that she's had off the pitch with her, her partner and her family has been unbelievable. And when we speak about the support networks um, around a player in these situations, and that's just as vital as the rehab process mm. because it's how you rest your mind when you're away from the gym. And, and like Kelly said, players deal with it differently. You know, you might have to go and rehab somewhere else for nine months mm. to be away from a team. Being around the team makes you feel connected to a team. It's just contract situations as a player out of contract. Like there's so many, you know, unknowns up in the air. Um, it's just honestly the most devastating thing to hear and, I just wish there was a solution or some more research that, that's being done to prevent this because there seems to be a common trend that needs addressing. There's a couple of things now. I'd love to get your take on this too, Rachel, but it's 25%, I think, of the 2022 Women's Ballon d'Or nominees, so 20 nominees currently on the sidelines with an ACL. So it just shows you that impact you were talking about on, on those huge players as well. I know the FA... They don't have a equivalent data for men's football, but they are saying at the moment the overall injury rates across the leagues have decreased in the past four seasons. But they say they're going to continue with that injury and illness surveillance work. So essentially they're looking at it and they're going to get that medical insight into women's football. Rachel, we all know it's got to happen, right? But do you feel there's there's been a shift this week that as devastating it is for Leo Williamson, these recent ACLs might just spark people into life. Yeah, but it's poor that you think that someone has to get injured to spark things into life. Um, you know, that the, there needs to be done. The medical staff at every team, I'm sure, well, I'm sure throughout the WSL, the championship, it, it really differs. And there should be a standard level for that. Um and a higher level. And I think it's really now shows that it's really important that we get women's health specialists into our clubs, not just, you know, physios that can rehab an injury, but they've only worked on male players. And, you know, I was reading something where it was saying like an ACL contributed could be because women are more quad dominant than hamstring. So if that's the case, then then we need some we need someone that specifically understands women's bodies are obviously the, the shape of the hips are different. Everything's different. So we can't just take it from sort of men's research or, you know, having having dealt with a, a male player. So I think these things need to be looked into. Um, you know, a kind of a question from me is is kind of like if women are more quad dominant then obviously as a faster player, you're probably, you've got maybe more hamstring strength. When the people that, and I don't know this, it, like I said, it's a question, it's kind of running around my mind. The people that have done hamstrings, are, are uh, sorry, have done ACLs, are they quick players? Because I, I, I was wondering whether that has a link to it. You know, if, um, if someone is a faster player, has more hamstring strength, is that balancing out the lack of quad strength? Or like, and I don't know the answer because I can't, I can't think of everybody that's done an ACL. Um, but the players that I'm thinking of are not necessarily your sprinters, and I'm wondering whether whether that is something that needs to maybe be looked into in terms of 
can we ever prevent an ACL? Because maybe it's just some people, obviously we know women are more prone to it, but then obviously all women are different, but some people are maybe more prone to it than others um, in the way they're built up. So just through reading different things, I'm just like, wow, this is, this is just crazy. It's, it opens up so many different things. So more research definitely needs to be done. I think more women's health specialists need to be working in clubs um, to understand players, to to get more advice. I mean, I remember as a, like a young young player coming through, I remember training with, with somebody. That's bad. I can't remember who the trainer's name was. But we we did like sessions on um on like how to how to jump how to land like so and i've never through the rest of my career working in a club nobody's ever done that like so it was someone that was actually trying to teach me as a winger as well you, you the likelihood of you getting taken out is pretty high so can you anticipate can you see what's coming can you actually practice and know how to land so things like that, if you're, because most of these ACLs are done where there's no contact. I know some of them are, but most of them aren't. So it's like, can we retrain somebody how to land? And maybe that might be, I don't know, something that helps. Doesn't that go back to my point, though, of as a young player, age 10, 11, 12, learning the basics? Um and that's probably where we need to start yeah. looking at that um, of teaching a young child at that at that point how to land, how to h- hold your quads when you land to protect your knees. Mm. Um, because at that, and, and don't forget, young girls only just recently of having equal access to football in schools, and that's where we we learn in in our schools in the playground. Mm. So I think that's vitally important that at that age, that's the fundamentals, the basics that these young girls need to be learning. But understanding your body as a youngster, do you know what I mean? Um, And then Mm. having in, you know, in academies, and I don't know the answer to this because they might have this, but having in academies specialists, because surely that's, you know, you can get to someone, uh, the, the younger they are, then you're really, you can make changes or help them develop or train them in the correct way rather than practicing something that is is negative mm. when the outcome might not show at 16, 17, but it might show at 20, 25, something like that. So, yeah, I just think that there's there's got to be a re um, you know, someone's got to look into it and rethink how we're, how we're doing our youth system, how we're doing the whole, the whole pathway coming through, I think. 